What's up, everyone? I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief at Front Office Sports, and I want to welcome you to Second Acts, a new series where we chat with athletes about all their accomplishments in their respective sports, but also talk about how they're thriving in their second act after retirement. Joining me today is Renee Montgomery, a West Virginia native with three girls' state basketball championships. Renee graduated from UConn in 2009, where she was a two-time All-American. She also played on an undefeated team that went on to win the NCAA championship that same year. In February 2021, Montgomery decided to retire after sitting out the 2020 NBA season to focus on social justice reform. That same year, Montgomery became a co-owner and executive of the Atlanta Dream, making her the first WNBA player to become a co-owner and executive of a WNBA team. Renee, it is so good to have you here today. Uh, how's it going on your end? Oh, it's going well. Thank y'all for having me. I already know, y'all should already know that we are a fan of front office sports over here. So we get a lot of our information from you guys and we report a lot on Montgomery and Company podcast from you guys a lot. So thank y'all for having us. Oh my God, that means so much. I really appreciate that. And now I'm going to flip the script on you. I want to get some information from your side. Starting off, can you tell us how you got into basketball? Uh, and if you want to get even a little deeper, some of your favorite memories from your playing days, both college and professional. You know, I started young. You know, one of those the Hooper stories that you hear all the time about starting young and then falling in love with it. That was literally me. I know Space Jam, they had came out with a song like, Basketball Jones, I got a basketball Jones. Oh, that's literally my life. Like when that song came out, I was like, finally, somebody gets it. So I started out in sports. Um, I was playing basketball, fell in love with it. My sisters and them were playing, so I played too. And then I just like fell in love with getting better because I wanted to be the player that was in, in the game because I didn't start playing. Like I started out where I was, you know, on the bench cheering for my teammates. So one of my first goals was how do I get off the bench to actually get some minutes in the game? Then it was how do I get some minutes that are valuable? And then just that's how it grew for me. So that's kind of how the Love Jones with basketball started. And then as things progressed and I started to look towards my future, I really just wanted to get a D1 scholarship. And then when I was 10, the WNBA began. And, and that's when things like I really was like, wow, you can have a whole career playing basketball. That's kind of where that thought process started with me. I guess I have to ask coming off of that, what is the most valuable lesson that you learned as an athlete? Man, the thing that I use even now to this day, like the thing I use right now is that work. Like you put in that work, you, you'll you see some type of results. Like, and you know, it's different because I came from the sports industry, which is still the entertainment industry. But with my sports background, I know that if I get my normal shots up, get my normal routine in, I feel the most prepared I can be. Usually there'll be results to, to follow. Well, it's a little bit different in the entertainment industry because you can put in that work, you can be on your grind, but in the entertainment industry, things have to go right. You know, opportunities have to go right. And so I've just learned that from sports when you put in that work, you put yourself in a position to be ready for when those opportunities come in entertainment. And that's kind of been the, the whole story of my life when it comes to entertainment. Yeah, I really want to understand more about that. You are in college, you're playing professionally, but that's one of the realities of sports that it comes to an end. Your career comes to an end. You're going to have to start another career. You're going to have to start a second act. You're going to have to figure out where things are going once you step off the court. And did you always know you wanted to get into entertainment after? Yeah, I actually did. Um, I always knew I wanted to stay around sports because I talked about it. I got this this love Jones with sports and, and basketball. So I knew at the end of the day, I wanted to just gravitate towards that. And so I ended up having a communications major from UConn thinking that it's going to take me into broadcasting somewhere as an analyst or, you know, a host. And I had no idea what was coming for me. You know, that's why I meant by that hard work and being prepared. Because I can remember when I first came out of school, I was doing ESPN games, but they weren't the headliner games. You know, it wasn't the number one versus number two team. It was teams that some people may not know any of the players that play on the teams. Those were the call the games I was calling. But I was getting my reps in. And then, you know, when I was taking various jobs, speaking engagements, a lot of them were what I call for the honor in a sense of they're not paying me to do it, but I'm doing it for the honor of being there. And so, yeah, I, I learned I learned a lot about 
myself in those times like how do you prepare when it's it's not the number one versus number two seed you know like when you're calling a big game or when you're playing in a big game yeah you're locked in you're focused you're gonna get your best you but I started just making a routine and a habit of this is how I'm gonna prepare when I'm calling any game I don't care if it's this game that players people don't know the players on it or if it's a big game that everybody knows every player and that's kind of how I started to build my, I would say, my routine when it came to the entertainment side of things because while you can't control it as much as you can control sports, you can be ready. In the midst of all that success, when do you start planning your second act and and how does that work? Can you take us through a little bit of the process? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because when you're a WNBA player, you probably should start planning your second act sooner rather than later. And honestly, if you're an NBA player or any other sport as well, because what we see going on right now in college sports is the name, image, and likeness. People are starting to understand the concept that you are your own brand. And athletes, it's getting drilled in for athletes because now with the collegiate athletes, we see that they can make money off of their name, image, and likeness, which is what we call nil. And so I want everybody to understand that. That's the thing that I think is important. Like When you think about name, image, and likeness, and brands well if you have a twitter you have your own brand if you have social media if you're doing any side hustle you are your own brand and i think the best thing that's coming from the college sports allowing for amateur athletes to get paid is that people are really starting to realize the power of being your own brand and so when i was a player I took that very serious. I took a, I took my brand serious in the sense of how did I go to practice? Well, you're I'm going to go to practice in a good mood. I'm going to go to practice knowing my scout. I'm going to practice ready every single day because that's my brand. And so you start to build your brand. I want my brand to be reliable. I want my brand to be trustworthy. I want you to make me your captain because then that says something about my brand as well. And then that's so to answer your question, I've always thought about my brand and my second act because I knew that what people see you as as an athlete, it's only going to be amplified once you enter your second act. So if people think that I'm trouble in the WNBA, well, a company's not going to want to hire me because I already don't have the work experience per se, that the typical work per se, um, experience. And then they're going to think, oh, man, if she wasn't on it in basketball, then why would she be on it over here in the office where it might not be as exciting? So I kind of always kept that in mind. And then in 2019, you know, I wanted – to start my foundation and so that was the first actual step in my my second act that I started it wasn't even with tv or entertainment it was my foundation in 2019 becoming a 501c3 that that's where I think my the first step in my second act started but again I've, I've always thought about it because I always understood that your brand will follow you wherever you go so you've been thinking about your second act for a long time, which I don't know if everyone can say, but what is the exact moment almost where you realize, okay, this is winding down. I got the foundation going. I'm about to pop off. I'm going to get this podcast going. I'm going to get my production company going. When did it all click for you? I think in 2020, everything started to come together again, just having more time than anyone. Like all of us had way more time than we were used to. And in that time, I really thought a lot about what was going on. Honestly, I started to notice too that all of the the lanes that I was in was sports only in a sense of the WNBA shut down, the NCAA tournament shut down during the pandemic, the NBA shut down during the pandemic. Well, then literally every single one of my jobs shut down because they were all in sports. So the WNBA wasn't going. That was my job. I cover the Hawks for Bally Sports. That shut down. So there goes another job. I was calling the NCAA tournament. That shut down. So literally all of my jobs shut down at once. And that made me realize I need to diversify my portfolio in a sense of I don't have anything outside of sports going on because look what happened when sports stopped. Everything stopped for me. So I would say that was the moment where I really started to think I got to start changing things up, getting in different spaces, getting in different types of just even fields because everybody always hears the saying, don't put your eggs all in one basket. But I found out why firsthand in 2020 when everything stopped. If Raina's thinking about retirement, she'll get some help from Fidelity to envision what's possible and balance risk and reward. And with a clear plan, Raina can enjoy wherever she's headed next. That's the planning effect from Fidelity. All right, so I'm just going to say you made history 
co-owner of the Atlanta Dream, executive in the front office. I mean, this is unprecedented. This is something that I think people have always wanted to see in our culture. You made it happen. What has that been like? What is the process like? You know, when do you get to the point where you say, okay, this team that I played for, I'm going to become an owner and I'm going to do something that really hasn't been done in sports before. You can take us through that. Yeah, that was, that's why you need people around you that see you differently than you see you because I'm so used to being in the sports world that becoming an owner of the team that I'm currently playing for, they never really even crossed my mind. Like that's just not a normal thought process because it's never been done to your point. But that's why, you know, <clears throat> my wife and business partner, Serena, she was the first person that said it to me. She was like, you know, I think you should think about buying the team. And I'm looking at her like, girl, what are you talking about? And she was just like, I think you should buy it. Why not? And she just kind of had this, she was not like, it was a matter of fact to her that, yeah, you should try. Like, of course you should try. And I was, and the more I thought about it, I'm like, well, I mean, I guess it doesn't hurt to try. And then the more I started to think about it, the more I wanted it and the more, you know, we wanted it, we just started to figure out, okay, how do we get there? Who do we get in contact with? Like, you know, we started going about, it's a long process too. It's not a short answer as to how it happened because this happened over months and months and months and months of, trying and planning and getting declined too so i know like a lot of people i don't know if they thought that we just woke up and we were the co-owners of the atlanta dream but it did not go that way at all there were ups and downs because this was a long process trying to even get to the table to talk about it and that's why i just i talk about my family so much and we talk about the podcast uh, moco because this really happened in real life that my family spoke life into me so much that I they made me believe that I could do something that I didn't necessarily know if I could do right away but because everyone believed it so much I went after it and now here we are talking about making history and that's why I always have to make sure I tell that part first because it's like man I made history and, and that's why me and my family made history because my family is the one that really saw that in me and now I consider it a responsibility. Well, and you're seeing the whole conversation about ownership happening, people of color, black people, like this is this is the movement right now. And you will always be a trailblazer as far as that's concerned. What is it actually like sitting in the seat? I mean, I think so much of the story has been getting up to that point. Oh, it's been announced, but you're in that position now. What goes on day to day? How does it work? You know, working with team operations. Can you tell us what it's like? sitting in that seat and the type of work that goes into it now that you're in the office? You know, for me, something that is very important is I want this to be a place where players want to come play because this is one of those teams that's going to treat you right. That's going to be one of those great organizations that, you know, while every organization has to do business and there might be trades and different things that you might not like as a player, but the way we handle things, the way we do our business we want to have a certain standard. And so those are things that are important. The lifestyle of the players, those are, those are very important. How players are marketed. Are they visible? Why aren't they visible? Those are things that I think about on, on a regular. I'm wondering where does this go from here? Like your first couple years post WNBA has been incredible. What is the next five years? What does the next 10 years look like? I'm sure now that you're in the middle of everything, you probably have a little more perspective on the future. And where do you think your career is headed now? Well, you know, I like to, you know, look at people that's done it before and done it ahead of me. So that's what me and Serena and my, you know, my business partner and wife do all the time. And so the people we look to, what was their next steps? So we look at The Rock and, and Danny Garcia to that matter. But you look at The Rock, well, what was his next move? He built out other projects ones that he necessarily doesn't have to be on camera for that makes sense to me because there's only so many hours in a day for me to be on camera for me to be in meetings so building out other projects and then when you look at a Issa Rae well what did she do she she had her own projects that she pitched to bigger companies like you know we already had awkward black girl on youtube but now we got insecure okay and it's on hbo that's what she did so getting our projects picked up and then you know when you there's just so many people that when you look at a kevin hart i like you know i always list people because people forget that there's some really big like i'm not very busy compared to when you look at what other people are doing and so that's what's next for me kevin hart he has his own network now laugh out loud network where he's putting a lot of different content out in a space he has his own uh studio now in la there's so much going on so when i look at what's next is 
building out think tank and building out projects alongside my family and, and building out a team that can have things that sustain rather than me just being on camera, there's other things going on. And so that's what's exciting for me. So I would say, I guess what's next is just, you know, think tank productions. Team owner, media mogul, but it doesn't stop there. Renee, you have so many other businesses and investments that you're focused on right now. And I want to talk a bit more about those. So joining us is your wife, singer, songwriter, and actress, Serena Grace. Also your partner in think tank productions. How are you doing today? We're doing, doing good. Thank Got the you. wifey in the building, okay? <laughs> thank you for having us. Oh my God! Thank you for joining us. <laughs> it's uh, it's really, it's really awesome to be able to talk more about Think Tank, especially knowing that you know it's something that's just getting rolling. I feel like we got the inside look. And in fact, why don't we just get into that? Can you tell us about Think Tank Productions, the company that you started? It, you know, it, it started, there's a whole story behind it. I know everyone has their origin story. So tell them about how like Think Tank Productions became a thing. <laughs> okay, so we believe in the power of manifestation, as a lot of people do, you know, and writing things down. So we started our own little just kind of like manifestation chat between my sister Renee and myself and um, her VP, Paul Garino. And so we were just like, okay, so whatever we want, let's just put it in this chat and uh, let's emphasize it and things like that. Let's just like really put power behind our words. And we started calling it the think tank. And so that was like in the summer of 2020 when we just like, we were just like manifesting, just trying to manifest things. And then we actually saw that some of the things actually started to come true. And we're like, you know, these are actually like pretty good ideas. <laughs> yeah. You know, what if we actually make this into a company, actually start making some of these ideas come to life. So, and so then, long story short, <laughs> long story, long story short. Yeah. So we like the name Think Tank because, you know, always just in life, we, both of us, we gravitate towards positivity and yes. just speaking that into our world, the power of just speaking it into your life and so if we want good things to happen with our production company well let's let's make it think tank let's speak that into it so yes. we're telling stories about representation we're telling stories that you may have heard of but don't know the full depth of it you know we're going inside of the women's basketball space with some things so you know we're just speaking life into those things and that's why we love the name think tank yeah yeah that's great i mean as someone who has uh a manifest note in my notes app. I, I know all <laughs> everything you yes, talking sir. about. Yeah, it's really important. I think probably inspiring for a lot of people to hear, you know, how you started, you you put your mind to it and now you're here. You have Think Tank Productions. But can we get a little more into uh you talked about the type of content that you're producing. Uh let us let's go deeper on that. Like what exactly <laughs> are you producing? What is the goal of the content you're making? Uh take us through some of that. Well, you know, one of the things that we're really with social media and the digital space growing at a rapid rate, one that's one of the places that we focus in on. So it's it's micro content. It's 10 minute episodes. Even we started with our own uh, vlog and it's called Muchos Montgomery's. And those are 10 to 15 minute hits where it's just fast paced. You know, everything has to be fast paced when you're talking about social media, and but like easy to digest, easily content. digest five to seven minute mini docuseries, like five to seven minute documentaries, just little telling mini stories because sometimes, you know, with production companies, they tell everyone tells the biggest story that you've ever heard of. There's going to be a lot of people covering that. But what about these little stories here and there stories in the city of Atlanta that need to be told? Well, those are the kind of things that we're going to gravitate towards. Yeah. And, and I think Renee hit it right on representation. Representation is, is mainly what we're not mainly is what we're all about. You yeah. know, we're we're uh, women led. And, and so we're, we really want to shed light on stories that are underrepresented. So we have a few projects in the works right now. And like Renee said, they are in the docuseries space because there's just um, we, we stick to non scripted. I'm not not saying that scripted is not down the line but non-scripted just because we feel like there's a lot of stories that need to be told that don't necessarily always get the platform to yeah. be told i want to thank you renee for joining us today and telling us all about the incredible journey to your second act it's only been a couple years since you retired from the WNBA, and you've done so much so much is going on you got media ventures you're a co-owner of the atlanta dream you are all over the place, and I think it's really inspiring. I really appreciate you giving us a 
inside look at that no, process. No, thank you guys for having me, and thank you guys for also having Serena, my wife and business partner. And like I said, we are friends of front office sports, so keep doing what y'all are doing because it gives it elevates athletes, and that's everything. Yeah, and you keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I think it's so important that people learn that there's so much more that you can do, that you can play, you can win championships in college and professional sports as you did, and then you can go on and start a whole new second act and keep that energy going. So thank you, Renee, again, and uh, I can't wait to see where things go from here.